My name is Amata, and in this Red Gaming Tech video, I'm here with your latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours, and I have a veritable buffet for you today, my friends. We're going to start things off with AMD, who have responded to CTS Labs and Ryzen 4 once again, as CTS Labs have decided to once again stir up the hornet's nest. Then we're going to move on to Intel, who have some launch-ready graphics drivers, which point to interesting things for the future. Then we're going to move on to the latest Steam hardware survey, and what it means for AMD CPU and GPU adoption rates. Then we're going to change topics to TSMC who have something very tasty for us indeed as they have unveiled wafer on wafer 3D stacked silicon. Then we're going to finish up the proceedings with Shadow of the Tomb Raider and how it's going to run on the Xbox One X. But as I said we're going to kick things off with Rise and Fall. Now I doubt many of you need an update on exactly what this is. This was quite the thing when it happened and the timing seems well suspect shall we see. But the TLDR is that a company by the name of CTS Lab Security revealed numerous vulnerabilities in Ryzen and Epic processor lines. Now, they dubbed these Ryzenfall, and they decided instead of giving AMD the customary 90 day notice between discovering the vulnerability and its public disclosure, they gave them an absolutely piddly 24 hours. And this went down like a sack of bricks, pretty much. Now, AMD did respond and we have covered that response, and I would suggest you go watch that video, if only for the little skit at the start, which I still think is really good. Anyway, so what happened was, earlier this week, CTS Labs emailed Tom's Hardware, and we'll include the link to this in the description below this video, and basically they expressed concern about the lack of updates from AMD on the vulnerability. And as they're basically saying, they believed that these vulnerabilities would take months to fix, and um, Especially the Chimera vulnerability would actually require a... Especially the Chimera vulnerability, which would take a hardware change that could not be implemented in products that have already shipped out. So, basically, CTS Labs contacted Tom's, basically saying, hey, we're a bit concerned because AMD have yet to really give us any updates on what's going on. But AMD have once again responded, and they said, quote, within approximately 30 days of being notified by CTS Labs, AMD released patches to our ecosystem partners, mitigating all of the CTS-identified vulnerabilities on our Epic platform, as well as patches mitigating Chimera across all AMD platforms. These patches are in final testing with, it, with our ecosystem partners in advance of being released publicly. We remain on track with be to begin releasing patches to our ecosystem partners for the other products identified in the report this month. We expect these patches to be released publicly, as our ecosystem partners complete their validation work. So obviously this doesn't mean that you know they're coming out tomorrow, AMD pretty clearly says that, yep we're working on these, what they mean by ecosystem partners is obviously just people they're working with within the company, perhaps IABs and stuff like that as well, but the long story short, regardless who they're working with, they are working on it and they haven't forgotten about the report. But Ryzen has yet to fall as their vulnerability promised, so yeah. Let's move swiftly on to Intel. So basically what we have here is a GPU driver which came out alongside the Windows 10 April launch and it did have the usual quality and power efficiency improvements that you'd normally expect with an Intel update but it also released a day zero launch ready graphics driver release. So this is nothing to you know get out the party poppers about and get out the party hats along with it but basically they're laying the groundwork for their dedicated graphics products and obviously we have seen them do graphic stuff with integrated GPUs and that sort of thing. But basically they're just kind of laying the groundwork here, preparing for the future as it were. Now obviously good software is critical for a good graphics card as we have seen with driver support. It can very much make or break a graphics line. But really, we're just kind of seeing, once again, the foundations being laid. We can't really expect to hear any solid details about anything, really, until we see Arctic Sound, Jupiter Sound go into at least the prototyping stage. And obviously, Intel probably going to talk more generally in the future as well about what they've got planned here. But it's just interesting that they're kind of setting themselves up for the future. However, we're going to move on to the Steam Hardware Survey. Now, I doubt many of you need me to tell you what this is, because this pretty much is an optional survey that anyone on Steam can do, and you can basically tell Steam what you have in your machine, so they know, okay, X percent of people have this, Y percent of people have that, and the rest have this. And basically what we have seen is that the GPU market on Steam, at least, has grown from 8.2% to 14.9% for AMD, of course, and then the CPU market share has also seen similar growth from 8.1% up to 16%. 
Now obviously this does still mean that Intel and Nvidia do still share the lion's share as it were, but it does show that AMD is kind of increasing their hold on the market and their popularity within that market. Now the most popular graphics card is still the GTX 1060 with 11.88% 11 and the top 20 GPUs are pretty much all Nvidia all the time. The most popular AMD graphics card is a just kind of generic Radeon R7 graphics and is used by 0.93% of Steam users surveyed. Now, do keep in mind this is surveyed people. This isn't everyone on Steam. But obviously, even if it's only a small portion of the people on Steam, you're still talking a huge amount of people just because of the sheer amount of users that Steam actually has. But we should also keep in mind as well, alongside the fact that this is only a sample of Steam's user base, there's literally nothing stopping you from going, yep, click, 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 whatever, 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 and then moving on with your life. They are not 100% reliable. The results are going to vary depending on who opts into the survey, but they do give us at least a rough ballpark figure of what's happening inside people's machines. You know, how many team red, how many team green, you know, how many team intel, that sort of thing. And again, the TLDR of all of this is we are still seeing domination from Intel and Nvidia but we are seeing an increase in interest in AMD which is good diversity is good for the soul I say anyway let's move on to arguably the most interesting piece of today which is TSMC so I'm sure you all are familiar with who TSM TSMC excuse me are and now they have revealed a very interesting technology indeed it is called wafer on wafer technology that allows for 3D stacked silicon on GPUs. And that pretty much is exactly what it sounds like. So, basically in this particular technology, there's no interposer or interconnect between the two silicon wafers. Instead, there are 10 micron holes, obviously very small, that form a through silicon via or TSV connection basically allowing back-to-back -back silicon wafers to make contact with one another. Now they have actually used a similar technology with two pretty impressive effects with DRAM and have allowed for increasing densities on very small chips and now they are hoping to use this technology on graphics chips. So basically the current stage only two wafers can be stacked on top of each other, but obviously as the technology improves, you can kind of get your Lego on and stack upon stack upon stack. So what would this actually result in? Well, you can kind of guess what this would result in as it would basically mean faster, more powerful graphics cards without increasing the size of the GPU or shrinking the fabrication process. Now, obviously the main sort of caveat to this particular method is yields because essentially you're taking two silicon wafers and welding them together basically meaning you have literally twice the chance to get a dud wafer at the end because if one of the two does not work that means the entire die is useless so at the moment wafer and wafer is relying on chips with pretty reliably high yield rates typically achieved when the fabrication process has kind of taken time gotten better gotten a lot smoother and basically means at the moment at least older chip generations are more likely to be part of TSMC's first wafer on wafer experiments and are at the moment expecting a success rate of roughly 90%. Now obviously we're going to see this take outside of just graphics cards, they are undoubtedly going to be looking to implement this in 7nm and 5nm fabrication processes but again they're looking to apply this to GPUs because well if you were to be able to stack basically two GP102s on top of each other, you're going to have basically the equivalent of two GTX 1080 ties in one, doubling the core count, and you can already kind of see the possibilities. You know, there are some insane possibilities with this particular technology. And considering that there's been various issues with die strings and all that sort of thing, this could be the sort of answer, or at least a answer, because often with technology there's multiple ways you can tackle a problem but this really has me intrigued like i love this idea what i would expect to happen is that a new gpu will come out on a new process and then once the process has matured and yields have improved and all that sort of stuff you will then start using wafer on wafer to use the chips that you already have 
to stack them together and essentially have what is going to be a whole new card, even though you've used the two wafers that you already have. Double the performance of the same generation. Obviously, this does mean that a generation could, in theory, last longer and obviously mean that you maybe have to replace your graphics card less, that sort of thing. But obviously, we'll have to see what kind of effect this would have on the lifespan of the graphics card and that sort of thing. But I am very, very interested in this. This could be a huge step forward to, also in, rather, graphics technology. Now, the main concern that you're probably having as the end user is, you know, how much is this going to cost me, basically? And that is a valid concern, because, you know, when you're taking two wafers that are not cheap, you're probably going to be expecting to pay a lot for that privilege. But they're not necessarily talking stacking two high-end wafers here. It could be, you know, two wafers that are just for example, for a GTX 1060, just, just to kind of throw a sort of fairly middling GPU out there and stack them together and all of a sudden, like, yeah, it was built on a GTX 1060, but it still doubled the performance and while we, while we doubled the price, you can kind of get where I'm going with this. But the price of the end product is definitely going to be a concern for most users, but obviously I can't speculate because they literally haven't even started really making them properly yet, so it'd be impossible to say. Anyway, let's move on to our final topic, which is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So, what do we have here? Well, we have an interview that took place between Electric Playground and Eidos Montreal boss David and Fossey. Now, of course, I'll include a link in the description below to the full interview. But the main takeaway that I want to talk about here today is the fact that he says that Shadow of the Tomb Raider is going to run at 4K 60fps on the Xbox One X. Now, unfortunately... He did not deign to mention whether or not this is native 4K and locked 60 FPS. Which obviously is fairly important information. You want to know, okay, is this real 4K? Okay, is it going to reach 60 once in the whole game and then spend most of it around 45? And obviously I'm being facetious here, but you kind of get my point. So I'd say hold off on the excitement cannons until we know exactly what's going on. But in some form it is going to run at 4K 60. I highly doubt it's 4K locked 60, but, you know, feel free to prove me wrong, Lydos. Feel free to prove me wrong. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe, and if you'd be so kind, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Tech. and I'll see you next time.